Well, we are in week three of road tripping. And in this series, we are talking about the journey every single one of us is on with Christ. We're all on a spiritual journey. And one of the greatest tragedies in the church world today is individuals have reduced church to simply showing up and getting advice rather than partaking in the adventure Jesus came promising and offering. And so the, the challenge of this series is would you embark on a journey with Christ? And would you continue placing one foot in front of the other and taking your next step? Every single one of us has a next step. Whether you've been a Christian for 30 years, whether you've been a Christian for 30 seconds, or maybe you're not a Christian and your next step is gonna be your first step. The challenge for every single one of us is would you go on a journey with Christ? And here's the deal. Like all road trips, there's some inconvenience. There's some bumps in the road. And here's the thing that I'm convinced of and I wanna put before you as we jump into this. Existence comes with resistance. No matter who you are, where you are, no matter what your background is, your personality, no matter how successful or not successful you are, no matter your gifts, skill set, your occupation, it doesn't matter. Every single one of us is gonna face some struggles. Every single one of us is gonna have trials and obstacles to overcome. Existence, it comes with resistance. And I'm convinced, and this will sound like a contradiction, but life is easier the moment you accept it's gonna be hard. Life is easier the moment you accept it's gonna be hard. The moment you just realize, hey, this thing comes with some trials. It comes with some tests. But I live full of faith and I live confident in the truth that declares, greater is he that is within me than he that's within the world, amen? So bring it on. And I was thinking about in the 90s, there was a band and their name was Chumbawamba. (laughs) Yeah, they had terrible marketers, right? Someone gave them terrible advice. And what was their hit song? I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never gonna keep me down. I get knocked down, I get up again. You're never going to keep me down. And ironically, they were a one hit wonder. The music industry knocked them down and they never got up again. I think that's hilarious. And I wonder, I just wonder if the world laughs at us because they hear us talk about the might and the power of our God. And they hear us quote scripture that says we are more than conquerors. Yet then they see us give up when any test or trial comes our way. My prayer is for every single one of us, as we embark on this journey with Christ, that we won't become one hit wonders, a flash in the pan, but we will stand the test of time and we will live faithful lives. The tragedy is, and the thing that has made its way into the church world is a longing and an appetite for convenience. Have you ever found that your life is governed by convenience? A lot of us, we just wanna take the path of least resistance. And so we, we gravitate towards convenience. And this is problematic because our Jesus didn't promise convenience. He promised significance. And how did he go about you know, offering this to us? He said, hey, would you follow me? In fact, would you pick up your cross and would you follow me? And church, our lives as followers of Christ isn't governed by convenience. If anything, it's governed by obedience. It's just living life with so much faith that says, no matter what it is, I offer God my best yes. God, you have my full devotion. And just know, in this life that we're living, if you're gonna follow Christ, my goodness, you're gonna face some resistance. And I think it's important to define, hey, what is the resistance that we face? I think there are three primary kind of forms of this resistance. And the first is the devil. Dun, 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 right? Like everyone's always uncomfortable when you talk about the devil. But I believe that the devil actually exists, that our God has an adversary. Now you should know this puny little devil is no match for our God. He's just an annoying nuisance, amen? 
It is what it is. But he still has a way of creating some disruption in our lives and in our world. He's something that we have to face. So there is a resistance from the devil. Scripture says he makes his way around like a roaring lion, seeking those whom he may devour, that he has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. There is a resistance, and his name is the devil. In addition to that, another form of resistance is the world. Have you ever discovered that the world and culture and society runs against the grain of your faith, runs against the grain of your convictions, runs against the grain of your values? And what you're going to find is it comes with some pressure. If you're going to live for Christ, this world that we live in is going to resist the God that you're serving. The world comes with some resistance. And the last form of resistance is the flesh. In other words, you. Have you ever found this to be the case? I've discovered this in my own life and it's super annoying. But I am the one thing all my problems have in common. <laughs> and you are the one thing all of your problems have in common. Every single one of us was born into a sinful nature. Every single one of us has this fractured part of us that it longs for things that really rebel against God's will for our life. And it's hard to accept, but the truth be told, you and I are the greatest obstacle God has to overcome when it comes to working in our lives. You are the greatest obstacle God has to overcome when it comes to working in your life. And so it's just saying, God, let me assess accurately. And let me just take an audit of my life and align it with your word. And God, if there's anything in my life that you think or seek to change, so be it. It's taken ownership. There once was a time where the devil was outside a church sitting on a, a doorstep and he was crying. And the pastor goes out to the devil and he says, puny little devil, why are you crying? And he said, because everybody inside keeps blaming me for all their problems. And I do think that is an easy thing to do, just to create a scapegoat mentality where it's all his fault and there's a devil behind every bush. But sometimes there's a fractured human in every mirror. And it's just saying, what in my flesh detests the things of God? And so there's a resistance. And I really want to take you through what I believe to be three pressure points of resistance. Every single one of us is going to bump into these in our faith. Three things that will come against our lives with Christ. And to do so, we're going to look at a story told of the guy by the name of Moses. Now, if you're new to the Bible, Moses was a legend. This guy has a fascinating story. And it's, well, there's not enough time today to discuss his entire story. But essentially, he was an Israelite. And he was an Israelite back when the Israelites were being held captive and as slaves in Egypt. And there's this fascinating course of events where Moses ends up in the palace and an Israelite child is raised as a son of the king in an Egyptian world. Over time, he, he grows in stature and he grows in maturity. He grows in awareness and he grows in conviction. And he looks out the window and he sees the oppression of his people and he sees the resistance and the injustice. And he sees the bondage and the slavery that they're in. And he has a dream. I'm going to liberate my people. So what happens is, as he goes out and he finds an Egyptian having his way with an Israelite. Moses takes matters into his own hands and he ends the Egyptian's life. Pretty quickly he realizes this is not the way to do it. And he takes off into the wilderness. And for four decades, church, 40 years, Moses is in the wilderness. And then God comes to him and says, hey, I'm going to send you back to liberate your people. Which is interesting because that was the initial dream that Moses had. And this is kind of a side note, but tuck it away, it'll serve you well. The problem wasn't with Moses' dream. The problem was with the dreamer. See, a lot of times we have dreams and a lot of them are God-given dreams. And we get frustrated because they don't seem to come to pass. 
And my question or curiosity simply is, I wonder if the problem isn't with your dream, but maybe with you as the dreamer. Maybe it is something that you need to grow into and maturate in the process. God, how do you wanna develop me also that you can accomplish your dream for my life? So Moses pushes back and says, clearly you have the wrong guy. They're not gonna listen to me. In fact, I have a speech impediment, which I love. I can relate to that. And God tells him this, look how God responds. He says, look, I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. He's basically saying, listen, it's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be worth it. It'll come with some tests and some trials and some resistance, but it's gonna be all right. And church, I feel pressed to tell some of you today, there will be resistance, but God will be victorious. Look, there, there will be resistance, but God, and that's a big but. Yeah, no, not this crowd, all right. <laughs> but God will be victorious. I think sometimes we lose awareness as to the magnitude of our God and who he is and what he's capable of, that he's brilliant and he's all powerful. He's all knowing and he's always present and he is in your corner and he has your best interest in mind. It's a big deal. And it makes me think of in the 90s, I grew up on the north side of Chicago and I was a Bulls fan, which in the 90s, you almost had to be a Bulls fan unless you were rooting for Reggie and the boys who put up a good fight. But the Bulls were amazing. And there was a year that their rival was the Utah Jazz. You guys remember these guys? This is one of the best duos in NBA history. Carl Malone and John Stockton, these two Hall of Famers, left an imprint on the game. But they kept running into Mike and Pippen. And I remember one year, everyone thought the Utah Jazz had the upper hand on the Bulls. Carl Malone was the MVP and everyone was talking, hey, we think the Jazz are gonna beat the Bulls. Now I grew up in a house where every morning while eating breakfast, we watched ESPN. Like the soundtrack to my childhood was da na na da na na Like that's just what we woke up to. And I remember there being a time where we're watching this news broadcast. And all these sports analysts are like, this is the jazz year. Carl Malone and the boys are gonna get it done. And I turned to my dad, I'm like, dad, have they forgot that the Bulls still have Michael Jordan? <laughs> they still have Mike. And sometimes I sense the paranoia in Christians. I sense the fear, the anxiety. We look at the world around us and we see you know, strife and struggle and we see things that contradict our faith and you can just sense the overwhelming worry welling up in people. And I think to myself, have we forgot who is on our team? Church, he's a big deal. He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and he remains seated high and lifted up on the throne of God, unshaken by nothing or no one, amen? He's a big deal. I love this guy. And it has me thinking about a few years ago, Chris and I were late to the game on this show called 24. There's all these people watching this show. And so we're like, hey, we should check it out. If you didn't watch the show, you didn't miss much. Basically, the entire show revolved around one day, one 24-hour day. And so an entire season would capture one day. And the main character's name was Jack Bauer. And this guy had some wild days. Like an entire episode would capture like 30 minutes of one day. And it was riveting. And I remember starting to watch it. There's like nine seasons and we get hooked and we start binge watching this show. And at one point, we're like in season two, and I am on the edge of my seat. Because this is why I just can't watch dramas. I get too emotionally invested. I'm too empathetic. Before you know it, I have compassion fatigue and I can't care about real people because I care too much about Jack Bauer. So there comes an episode where Jack is on the ropes and it looks like he's not gonna make it. And I'm thinking to myself, 
he might be done. And then it hits me. There's nine seasons. <laughs> There's no way he's going to be done. This show continues to carry on, and he's the main character. And I think and I pray that the same epiphany would land in your home. That the next time you feel yourself welling up with anxiety, you would remember how this story plays out. If you're new to scripture and you haven't read the book, in the end, we win. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We win. There will be resistance, but God will be victorious. So Moses sets out and he heads back and he starts to have these negotiations with Pharaoh. It's fascinating. He goes to him and says, listen, you got to let my people go. Pharaoh's like, you're nuts. He, and then he starts pushing and he's pushing. And he's saying, hey, let me and some men go and make sacrifices and worship to God. This is what he has commanded us to do. And so there's this exchange taking place. And watch what happens in Exodus chapter eight. It says, then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, go, sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Moses said that would not be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord, our God, would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? We must take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifice to the Lord, our God, as he commanded us. So again, three pressure points. And the first pressure point that comes to Moses and Aaron and the same pressure point that's gonna come to you and I as we say yes to Christ is simply this. Don't leave Egypt. That's what Pharaoh says. Okay, do your God thing, but don't leave Egypt. Which what does Egypt represent? A place of slavery, a place of bondage, a place of oppression. And he's saying, don't leave Egypt your place of slavery, yet still do your God thing. And some of you, you're gonna say yes to Christ, or maybe you've already said yes to Christ. And the thing that is holding you back is this oppressing idea that you can do your God thing without leaving your Egypt. And so what happens is, is we, well, we resort to a shallow, unfulfilling Life with Christ that doesn't represent the life Jesus died to give us. And I believe that is cultural Christianity, which is what our nation is being exposed of. Everywhere you look, our nation is being exposed of faulty, shallow faith. Individuals who call themselves a Christian, but when push comes to shove, they're faulty in their commitment. That is cultural Christianity. And here's how I would define cultural Christianity. Christian banners without Christian manners, right? We have all these Christian banners and still to this day, they're still in style. So you can rock a cross as a necklace. You could throw one on your arm as a tattoo or you can hang one up in your house as a decoration. They're still good banners. Yet in many cases behind these banners, there's a deficit of Christian manners, individuals who look and act like Jesus. And it had me thinking about some of the games we played growing up in school. Remember if it were ever raining outside and you couldn't go outside to recess, so the teacher would have you play games in the classroom? And they would have you play games like Heads Up, Seven Up. Come on, show of hands at all of our campuses. Yeah, if you played Heads Up, Seven Up. I mean, that was an awesome game. Tragically, my parents back then used to dress me in these windbreaker sweatsuits. <laughs> so you couldn't walk without it being like. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to develop an entire strategy. I would walk around the classroom like this so no one would hear me coming. In addition to that, in my mind, I thought, well, there's some of us up here are boys and there's some of us up here are girls. If I press too th firmly on someone's thumb, well, they'll know it's a boy. But if I tickle their thumb, they'll think it's a girl. Which sounds really strange saying out loud in front of a group of people. But <laughs> these are the games we played. Another one we played was Simon Says. Remember this? I mean, how old were you when you were taught the game Simon Says? My kids, 
learned it as kindergartners. You can grasp the game of Simon Says at the age of five. Simon Says, touch your nose. Simon Says, touch your ears. Touch your knees. Oh, Simon didn't say touch your knees. You're out, right? A five-year-old understands what Simon says and what he didn't say. Church, it doesn't take a theologian to tell who is doing what Jesus said and who's not doing what Jesus said and who is doing something else that never came out of his mouth. I mean, it's pretty clear. Jesus said, be generous. He didn't say, be greedy. Jesus said, speak the truth. He didn't say, spread lies. Jesus said, be peaceful. He didn't say, be hateful. Jesus said, be graceful. He didn't say, be resentful. Jesus said, pray for unity. He didn't say, participate in division. It doesn't take a theologian to discover who's rocking a Christian banner without living out some Christian manners. And church, my prayer is we would be known by our Christian manners more than we are by our Christian banners. And just saying, hey, we live a life that reflects Christ. And just know there's gonna be a tension between the world's demands and God's commands. But church, here is the deal. The world's demands do not trump the Lord's commands. The world's demands do not trump the Lord's commands. They don't trump them. And what we're trying to do is, is force our God into tiny man-made boxes. And I think and I wonder if God is claustrophobic in some of the spaces we're trying to put him in. God doesn't fit in any man-made box. Our God reigns supreme over all things. He's a big deal. But you have to leave your Egypt. You have to step out of your place of bondage. You need to move away from maybe toxic relationships or dysfunctional habits. And you need to embark on a journey that leads you into the freedom found in only Jesus Christ. Some things in your life, well, chances are they have to change. When my kids were younger, all four of them had this issue. It was interesting. All four of my children hated getting their diapers changed. Every time it came to changing their diaper, they would throw a fit. And over and over again, I found myself saying the same thing. Look, we're gonna have a lot of fun. We're gonna go to the park, we're gonna go to the pool, we're gonna go to the zoo, but first we have to get you changed. And I get the feeling God looks at the mess you're sitting in, nailed it, <laughs> and thinks, listen, we're gonna have a lot of fun. Life is gonna be fulfilling. You're gonna discover a peace that surpasses your understanding. You're gonna taste a supernatural joy and a supernatural strength. And you are going to discover a purpose on your life. It's going to be amazing. But there's some things we have to change. Do not fall prey to the, the pressure of don't leave Egypt. That is a pressure point. So the conversation continues and check this out. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the wilderness. But check out this statement. You must not go very far. Now, pray for me. Would you ever found non-believers in your life trying to borrow your faith? Hey, now pray for me. But this is interesting. Pharaoh recognizes, okay, these guys need to go and worship. But then he applies the next pressure point. And the next pressure point is don't go too far. First, it's don't leave Egypt. If he can't keep you in Egypt, well, then he'll try to keep you from going too far. One way of saying it is if the devil can't keep you from being a Christian, he'll try to keep you from being a committed one. Or another way of saying it, if the opposition can't keep you in Egypt, he'll try to keep Egypt in you. And there's all this resistance. Hey, don't take it too far. You ever heard someone say that? Don't take it too far. You give your life to Christ and suddenly people think you're, you're out of your mind and they start to try to restrain you in your life and pursuit of Jesus Christ. Don't take it too far. I mean, think about sporting events. I love going to sporting events because I love sports and 
I love people watching. And I find that people who lack self-awareness are a gift to all of us, amen? <laughs> These are there's some amazing humans out there. And there's a time I was at a football game and I just love people who are just, I mean, they're, they're fanatical about their team spirit. I'm looking down and there's a group of men in some pretty impressive seats. So clearly they had some impressive jobs, right? And they're down there with their shirts off and their entire upper body painted in blue. It was awesome. And I was loving it. And I thought to myself, you know what? No one ever goes up to that guy and says, hey, you're taking it too far. This is strange. <laughs> but the moment a Christian lifts their hands in worship in a sanctuary in a holy space, suddenly that's weird. Please. We got to be careful we don't succumb to such double standards. Hey, I'm going to go all out for the one who gave his all for me. Amen. And I just pray we all just say, I'm, I'm going after the things of God. That's what I love about Baptism Sunday. Individuals saying, hey, I'm going public in my faith. I'm letting everyone know I'm with Christ. And I'm going all out for the one who went all out for me. See, I think the question people always ask is how far should I take it? Which I think is the wrong question. I think the right question is how far did he take it? Not long ago, I was reading this, this article on the movie, The Passion of Christ. Mel Gibson produced this movie and it was well done and it captured the crucifixion of Jesus. And there was this huge debate over the movie because it was rated R. And so individuals within the faith community thought that was inappropriate. A Christian movie should not be rated R. And so they had all these interviews and I'm reading this article where Mel Gibson and others who produced the film were responding to the criticism. And one thing they said is like, you should know, after we did a historical deep dive and study of the cross, we found there's no way you can capture it and it not be rated R. They went on to say they went to great lengths to make the crucifixion palatable for us and most viewers. And it was interesting because I'm, I'm reading through this article and there's a couple pictures of Mel Gibson talking to Jesus. And I seen this picture and I thought to myself, is this what I look like explaining my sacrifice to Jesus? <laughs> or maybe this, this is me arguing how inconvenient my life is following Jesus. And I just wonder, are you hesitant to give your all for the one who gave his all? I think sometimes we just are too reserved, too hesitant, too passive, too bashful, too ashamed to live boldly for a God who split the sky, stepped into our shoes, snatched the keys from hell and granted eternity and grace for all mankind who put their faith in him. That is outstanding. There's this poem that I love and it says, one step won't take you very far. You've got to keep walking. One word won't tell folks who you are. You've got to keep talking. One inch won't make you very tall. You've got to keep growing. One deed won't do it all. You've got to keep on going. Go further. Whatever your next step is, give and offer God your best yes. Don't just say it. Actually be about it. Church, my encouragement to you is don't offer God lip service. Offer him life service. God, I'm not here to offer you lip service. I'm here to offer you life service. So the debate continues between Pharaoh and, and Moses. And remember that part where, where God told Moses, hey, unless a mighty hand compels him, he won't let you go. God recognized that this this ruler and this society and this culture had a firm grip on his people. And he's saying, listen, I am going to take a wrecking ball and I'm going to loosen the grip that is on my children. And so what happens is, is God just starts flexing on Pharaoh. I mean, you want a fascinating read. Read Exodus chapter eight, 
Exodus chapter 9, Exodus chapter 10. God's throwing the wildest things at them. Plagues of gnats and plagues of flies and plagues of locusts and all darkness. And it is wild. And what you see is God is throwing a wrecking ball into the situation. I read that story and I think to myself, my goodness, that sounds terrible. I would much rather experience 2020 again than experience that again. But what you find is God was loosening the grip that this culture had on his people. And I think we're gonna get down the road maybe two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and we're gonna look back in hindsight and we are going to trace the hand of God over this entire season. And we're gonna look back and see, hey, God was loosening the grip that this faulty culture had on his people. And he was taking a wrecking ball to idols and things that were not worthy of our devotion. And he was liberating his people in a way that only his might and his hand could do. It's a mighty, powerful God. So in this exchange, Moses keeps pressing. He says, you have to let us go. Let us men take our women and children, go offer sacrifices and worship. To which Pharaoh is just biffed by the whole thing. And he says this, Pharaoh said, the Lord be with you. In other words, over my dead body, you better pray there's a God. If I let you go along with your women and children, clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord since that is what you have been asking for. So the three pressure points, don't leave Egypt, don't go too far, and the last pressure point, don't take anyone with you. You're gonna live a life for faith and before you know it, individuals and situations will discover that you can't hold that one back. So maybe we'll try to restrain them from taking others with them. And I'm telling you, what brings this journey of faith to life is embarking on a mission with God to seek to redeem and to rescue humanity with the goodness of his grace. So maybe God wants you to bring your spouse to work with you. And maybe God wants you to bring your children to work, or the church with you, sorry. Or or maybe God wants you to reach your coworkers or, or reach your classmates, reach your teammates. Maybe God is seeking for you to reach your neighbor and those who live among you. Who are the people in your life that for whatever reason, God has given you some measure of influence and you might be the conduit of hope and grace and truth and love and joy and strength in that person's life. You might be the answer to their prayers. And I just know every single one of us is connected to somebody who God loves dearly, who is yet to meet Jesus. And church, it takes all kinds of people to reach all kinds of people. There's people in your life you could reach, I could never reach. But I say we rise to the occasion. and We stop being passive in our faith and we step up for the cause of Christ and we advance the local church and we let anyone and everyone know that there is a God who loves them dearly, who is on the throne, who holds the world in the palm of his hands, who has their best interest in mind. That is our journey, amen. Church, we are going to celebrate baptisms, which are my favorite weekend. I think as church, we not only exist to declare the gospel, we exist to demonstrate the gospel. Baptism is a public declaration of a private or inward, you know, transformation. Essentially, we believe that baptism is the wedding ring of the Christian faith. And say, hey, just so everyone knows, family, friends, coworkers, strangers, I'm with Jesus. So some of you, you're gathered here today to celebrate our friends going public in their faith at all of our campuses. And there's so many remarkable stories. You know, we have two individuals who somehow got connected to Northview and watch online from California who came here today to be baptized with our church. Is that not outstanding? That is wild. (laughs) 
At all of our services so far, we've had individuals spontaneously say, hey, today's my day. I'm going public. I'm being baptized. We even have some people just showed up so full of joy to celebrate their friends. And for, in fact, here at the Carmel campus, we have a young lady by the name of Addie. And she has an entire glam squad sitting over here ready to cheer her on. It's impressive. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pass it back to all of our campuses and they can lead out this next moment. And I'm going to ask the rest of you to bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you for your desire to liberate your people. God, life comes with resistance, but may we stand firm knowing you will be victorious. God, you're good. And help us not succumb to the pressures of this world, but rise to the occasion to be a part of your story. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, amen.